our Black History Month programming. And your physical body, right? Does your shoulder, do your shoulders start to tense up? Does your face get hot, right? So that self-awareness piece can help us have productive conversations about colorism. And then the third best practice I recommend for conversations around colorism is empathy. This is a big one. So the first two are more about how you show up to the conversation. And the third piece is about your ability to listen to other people, right? And so in conversations around colorism, oftentimes people have a wide range of experiences related to their own complexion and their own features. And so we have to be able to balance our truth without negating or trying to shut down the truth that someone else has and realizing that pain comes in many forms, right? And so practicing empathy in our quest for some truth and reconciliation, okay? So on the agenda for today, we have one, I'm gonna define what colorism is. Although we could probably go more quickly through this piece um, because all of you posted that you were already familiar with it. But just to cover my bases, especially since this is recorded, I want to make sure we have a definition for colorism to make sure that anyone who comes on later or who watches the recording has that sort of base level of knowledge. And then I'm gonna talk about three layers uh, of how colorism manifests, particularly in college camp on college campuses. And so I call that my three eyes of manifestation. The first is the individual manifestation, right? And then the second one is the interpersonal interactions that we have. And the third one are institutional issues around colorism. And then of course, you know, I can't leave y'all without talking about some things that we can do about this problem. And then we'll end with more of an open Q&A and discussion to take your comments, thoughts, and questions. Now, again, this is called Colorism 101. We're only here for about 90 minutes. And there are so many nuances and complexities to the issue of colorism that we won't fully get to unpack here. But I wanna set the expectation now that this should not be the end all be all conversation that you have on colorism. See this initial conversation as a launching point for you to go out into the world, go out into your communities and your student organizations and your classrooms and to bring the conversation there as well, okay? Any questions before I get started, before we jump into the meat of things? All right, good. I'm glad some people are turning on their video. <laughs> okay. So, of course, being the English professor that I am, I love the fact that I get to quote Alice Walker every time I do a presentation on colorism, right? So, most famously known as the author of The Color Purple, but in a book of essays called In Search of Our Mother's Gardens, Alice Walker actually is credited with coining the term colorism. And so it's in a chapter called, if the present looks like the past, what will the future look like? And that chapter, so the, the majority of the chapter is a letter that she wrote to a light-skinned friend talking about a previous discussion they had about skin tone and about colorism. So in that letter to her friend, Alice Walker says, in part, Prejudicial colorism is prejudicial or preferential treatment of same race people based solely on their skin tones. So I wanna unpack a couple of things in this very short quote. One, it's pre prejudicial or preferential treatment, right? So a lot of times we think a systemic problem is just about who's being oppressed. But another important component is who's being privileged, who's getting preferential treatment as well. And so it's both sides of that coin that help you better understand how colorism might show up on college campuses. The other important thing is that colorism is not the same as racism. A lot of times in U United States in particular, we use color as a synonym or the euphemism for race. But those things are very, very different. You can be the same race and have very different skin tones. Again, I know my audience now, since I polled you all at the beginning, you all are probably aware of that, even within the same families, right? So the same nuclear families are, would have the same race, and yet the siblings of the children in that nuclear family could come out with very different skin tones. And so colorism is not about people of different races being treated differently. It's about people of the same race being treated differently because of the shade of their skin, okay? 
And if there are any questions, I'm monitoring the chat as I go. So please take, you know, drop a question mark if you want me to pause or repeat something. And I think it's important to remember that race is the social construct. Race is what we created. It's a system, not we, not we, but some people in history created these categories, this social system and a social hierarchy based on race. But I always like to remind people that our skin tone, our hair texture, our eye color, our facial features, these things are biological facts. And so even if we were to make progress against racism, we still have to deal with the biological reality that we look different, right? I always say, even if we did away with racial categories, even if we ended the concept of race, I would still walk into a room and my, uh, the amount of melanin I have would be the same, regardless of what we call it, right? And so that's sort of my little pitch as to why colorism is just as important an ism to talk about. A lot of times people will say, well, isn't racism the real issue? Isn't racism the real problem? And I think they are equally important for reasons I just stated, is that progress in racism still leaves a lot of lot left on the table in terms of how we're discriminated and how we actually interact with people. I'll also say this, when you see someone and you assume their race, you base that assumption on the way they look. For example, no one ever asked me the question, well, what are you? Why? Because of how I look. Does that make sense? Um, okay, so we'll keep going. Again, take notes. Write things in the chat. If you need to come back to something that I say in the discussion, I want you to you know, have that note thought written down for yourself. So an important thing, another important aspect about colorism is that it is multicultural. So I know it's Black History Month. I'm excited about that. But you know, for those who may not know, colorism happens across all racial groups and it happens across the world. So this collage is actually a collage of individuals who participated in my international writing time. You can see just visually that the skin tones span the spectrum and that the facial features, the hair types, right, are very diverse. And what I love about having this collage of people who had something to say about colorism is that it shows that diverse people all have something to say about colorism, right? A lot of times when I, in my early years of talking about colorism, again, back in 2013 and prior to that, people assumed it was just dark skinned black women who were complaining about colorism, right? And I put complaining in quotes. But through my work, I, my eyes were also opened to just how diverse this issue really is, the diversity of people who are impacted by this issue. And so colorism can happen with pe amongst people of the same race, but it can also happen amongst people of different races, right? So certain ethnic groups that tend to be lighter skins might receive preferential treatment, for example, or assimilate more easily in terms of immigration patterns and things like that. And colorism is intersectional. So the word intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, back in 1989, I believe. She's a law professor. And she came up with the term to describe the particular violence that Black women experienced because of both their race and their gender, right? And so she saw a gap in the literature. She saw a gap in the conversation. And so she came up with language to help describe what had previously not been described, had previously not been talked about. And so the word she chose is intersectionality. And that word has been useful, not just for Black women, but for other aspects of identity, such as ability, such as sexuality, such as class, such as um, levels of education and different other aspects that impact how we either experience oppression or how we experience privilege, right? And a combination of those things. So just like streets intersect from different directions, you have traffic coming to a central point from different directions. We can have oppression or privilege or interesting mix of both coming and converging into our bodies, into our lives from different directions. Are we, are we good? Y'all following me? All right. 
again, we're going to jump right in now. I want you to type one or two words that describe your skin tone. I'm going to take your time. It's, we're not on the clock here in terms of like who gets the first chat typed up. So take, your, take a moment. Actually look at your skin too. I don't want you to think about your skin tone. If you're able to actually see your hand or see your face in the video screen, I want you to actually look at your skin tone. The reason why I say that is because a lot of times we have notions about who we are and what we look like, but we haven't actually taken the time to sit and say, well, what do I actually look like? That's what they say I look like. That's what my parents say. That's what my friends say. That's what, you know, media says. But when I look at myself, what do I actually see? Okay, so JC says yellowish brown. Dr. Williams says privilege within my community. Yes. Um, medium brown from Janice. Yeah, so we have my mom's color. Okay, I like that Travis took a slightly different approach to the response, right? Um, so we have some more literal responses, right? Like yellowish brown, so actually naming skin tones. Um, but Travis chose in the description to relate it to or compare it to another person's skin tone, right? And I think that's revealing in terms of family dynamics and how, as we're growing up, as we're being conditioned and groomed in our various environments, if children notice if they are the same color as the rest of their family or not, right? I work with clients who, even though they are many shades lighter than me, they were several shades lighter than their family growing up, right? And that was a painful reality to them to be the different one, to stand out. And so, you know, as we're growing up, we notice things like that. So that is definitely an important um, element of people's experiences with skin tone and complexion and colorism. All right. Also, I'll say too, that what I find a lot of people tell me and over the years in working with me um, are just, you know, DMing me on Facebook or Instagram, is that talking about color, talking about skin tone, just like talking about race was taboo for them, right? I have, um, thinking about one client in particular who said, there's a lot of pain and shame about saying my skin is brown or about saying I have freckles on my face or about saying, you know, I got a little bit tan because I was outside gardening all day Saturday, right? And so starting to get comfortable and normalize everybody's favorite word these days, normalize just saying basic descriptions, basic facts about how we look. And I'll, I'll make this note as well. But just like I asked you, you know, what your relationship is to the university, right? Are you a student? Are you a faculty member? Are you a community member? And those are facts of life. And we don't necessarily attach an emotion to those things, or maybe we do, right? But the fact in and of itself is neutral. And so if we feel angst or if we feel pride even in any of these random facts about ourselves, it's not about the fact itself, it's about how we've been conditioned to view that aspect of who we are. Okay, so I hope you all are practicing self-awareness. If it was kind of easy for you to just write a description of your skin tone, or if you felt a little tense in doing that, that's an important thing to note. All right, so we are in Black History Month. So I wanna zoom in a little bit on African-American history and colorism. So even though it's a global issue, I think the African-American experience has a lot of the similar patterns that you'll see in other places, other countries, right? One of those things being slavery. So especially in the Western hemisphere, especially in the Western hemisphere, but you know, also in other places as well, you know, the slave trade touched the entire globe, if we're being honest. Um, but within the Western Hemisphere, in the Americas, plural will say, the system of slavery had a large impact on colorism. For one, the varying skin tones of African American people resulted in the United States from rape and from sexual exploitation of enslaved African women, right? And countries in South, Central and South America, there was a looser system 
in terms of intermarrying, right? And so a lot of times there were not the strict miscegenation laws, right? So in the United States, they fought very hard to keep white people and people of African descent from intermarrying and having children. But in other countries, especially in Central and South America, they were looser about that. The culture was not as rigid about who you could marry and you know, partner with. But that is why there are such so many varying skin tones amongst people who are called Black or people who are called African American. Because of the one drop rule, I have to plug a book that I did not write, <laughs> but it just dropped recently, I think this week, Dr. Yaba Blay, you may have heard of that name, very prominent um, activist and advocate in terms of colorism. Dr. Yaba Blay just published the one drop rule. And so that's a book about what I'm explaining here, how if you descend from Africa and even the smallest amounts, you were still considered black. And so people who fall into that category of black have a wide range of ancestral lineage as well as a wide range of phenotypes, features and skin tone. Now, post slavery, that sort of privileging of whiteness and a proximity to whiteness led to practices like skin bleaching and the more central place in history of lighter skinned African Americans. So if you can see on the far bottom right there, and I'll have to move some things off the screen, is an ad for a bleaching cream. These ads were commonly placed in black magazines, such as Ebony, which you'll see on the left, I'll get to that. But if you can, I don't, I'm not sure if you are able to read the text, but it says, the nicest things happen to girls with light, bright complexions as part of their advertisement. And there are a host of these. I think many of them are available in a Google search, right? If you just Google skin bleaching ads in the United States or you know, in the African-American community, you'll see a lot of these where they try to sell bleaching creams by saying you're more likely to get the job and you're more likely to get the guy. Okay, so playing on those two aspects of culture and life in particular. In the center, does anyone know who this is an image of? In the central image, close, not Angela Davis. I can see why you would guess that. <laughs> So this is actually Kathleen Cleaver. <laughs> yeah, so Travis says that was his guess as well. So Kathleen Cleaver was sort of like a counterpart to Angela Davis, right? Although Angela Davis never officially joined the Black Panther Party, Kathleen Cleaver, you know, if you can tell by the last name, was married at one point to Eldridge Cleaver, right? So she had a much more prominent role in the Black Panther Party, right? But very similar, the reason why all of you said Angela Davis is because Angela Davis rose to prominence, right? Her image became sort of an icon and still is very much an icon of the civil rights movement, of the Black power movement, of the Black is Beautiful movement even to this day. And so women like Angela Davis and like Kathleen Cleaver, who's featured here, um, they were Black and they were pro-Black, but they garnered a lot of mainstream media attention because their skin was lighter and their features were more alkaline, right? They had more European phenotypes. And we think about other famous people like Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, W.E.B. Du Bois, Malcolm X, right? And I'll talk more about this when I get to later parts of the presentation, but we have to remember that as we are celebrating icons of Black history, is there diversity within the Blackness that we're celebrating, right? Um, and then on the left side, I think is a particularly nuanced, or maybe not so nuanced, <laughs> example of how colorism continues to be perpetuated. So this is an issue of Ebony in February of 1966. So that's again, the height of the civil rights movement. It's the height of the Black is Beautiful movement, 1966. And yet on the cover, it says, are Negro girls getting prettier? And so what do you notice? I'll, leave, I'll, I'll let you observe for a second that we have this question. It's an implication, it's implied 
something's being implied here by the question, are Negro girls getting prettier? And then the particular Negro quote unquote girls that they chose to feature around that question. Um, they are getting fairer. This is so wild, never knew Ebony had these kind of covers, straight hair, lighter skin, slimmer noses. Exactly, yeah. And so media throughout history has subtle ways of conditioning us to think certain features are prettier than others, right? And so it doesn't literally say that light skin is prettier, but it's an implication. I think this is a more obvious implication, but there are even subtle ways of implying that in the media. This is just one of many examples. The coming to America is in the news these days because they're coming out with a sequel soon, or it, maybe it has already come out. But I remember growing up watching Coming to America, the, the very implicit, to me it was blatant colorism, right? So you had two, three women total in the film who were potential queens, who were potential brides to the prince. Two of those women were dark skinned and one of those women was a, women was a very fair skinned um, woman with looser curl pattern of hair, right? And so who of the three became ultimately the bride and the queen? To the main character. And so, you know, this magazine cover, I think, is a very clear example. And I think people point to the Black is Beautiful movement. People point to the civil rights movement in the 1960s as an era where we were loving Blackness, where we were super, super pro-Black. And so I, that's why I love this cover in particular as an example of how colorism pers has persisted, even despite natural hair movements, even despite Black is beautiful movements, right? Um, okay. So we're about to jump into the three layers of colorism as it manifests currently, as it can manifest. And I say currently, but these things are consistent throughout time. So they'll be individual, interpersonal, and institutional. And I want you to think about which of these sort of layers has impacted you the most? either in college or currently if you're out of college or have some other kind of relationship to college. So in terms of individual impact of colorism, I'd like to break it down even further into two categories of physical health and mental health. So physical health, there are burgeoning studies that show that darker skin individuals demonstrate higher levels of physical stress in the body. And there are also issues in terms of access to healthcare. A lot of them stem from stereotypes about black people, especially darker skinned black people. Um, surveys of students in medical school, for example, having stereotypical beliefs about black patients. And we look at the trend of black mothers dying in childbirth, right? And so that stereotype of black women being stronger or even that the stereotype that black women are more promiscuous, right? And those stereotypes are exacerbated and compounded the darker you are. And then there's the mental health component, which many of you probably are aware of already, is that colorism, experiences with colorism impact self-esteem, it impacts body image, and there's trauma related to colorism specifically. So I, I separate self-esteem from body image for a couple of reasons. So body image is really just how you feel about the way you look and also your belief about how other people perceive you. But self-esteem is beyond just how you look. So people who have negative experiences with colorism, darker skinned students, for example, in, in school, K-12 school and in college, might develop low self-esteem around their intelligence. They might develop low self-esteem about their abilities and their self-efficacy in the world as well. So colorism, a lot of times we focus on who's pretty and who's not, or who's handsome and who's not. But that self-esteem piece bleeds into other aspects of life as well. Um, so they see in the comments says COVID has really exposed this even more in terms of the disparities in healthcare. Absolutely. And then the other thing about mental health is the trauma related to colorism. So again, I mentioned I talk to a lot of people, you know, I'm working with clients and things like that around their experiences with colorism. And so some examples of traumatic experiences could be abandonment, physical abuse, verbal abuse, isolation, right, from caregivers in particular, 
or um, social groups and peer groups, right? And so being attacked or being ignored or being um, neglected because you are not valued or because there is some sort of fetish, right, being that makes you a target and, and vulnerable, especially as a child. A lot of these things result from colorism and people have to deal with them in terms of their mental health as adults. All right. So these things do not exist in a vacuum. So all of these individual impacts of colorism are very much tied to the interpersonal dynamics of colorism. And so interpersonal means between two or more people. And on a college campus in particular, um, before I go there, I wanna clarify one thing too. So I'm talking about a lot of experiences off campus because students don't leave those experiences behind when they come to campus, right? And faculty don't leave those experiences behind when they come to campus and staff don't, right? So whatever you experience off campus, whatever you your upbringing was like, whatever your home environment was like, you very likely are carrying some of that baggage with you that impacts and influences how you navigate a college space. So just for clarity, that's why I'm including things not specifically related to the college experience per se. Okay, so on college campuses, the social life is a big thing, right? I think we can agree with that. Um, there are studies that show that having an active social life, having involvement in extracurricular activities leaves students a better chance for overall academic success, right? And so colorism has impacted students' sense of belonging, okay? It impacts how they go about making friends or whether or not they feel they can make friends. It definitely impacts dating, you know, for since so many of you said you're familiar with colorism, that is one of the most common lines of thinking around colorism is dating preferences, right? And quotations. And then social events, right? So student parties, organizations hosting social events and that kind of thing. And so there, the interpersonal piece, I think is where a lot of students of all skin tones really feel it because colorism, is a social hierarchy, but because there's a hierarchy, there's also conflict between people on different levels of that hierarchy, right? And so some of the research, many of the, much of the research is qualitative research, right? So there's still a lot of left in terms of getting statistics, for example, and numbers, for example, about what it's like to live on a college campus. So a lot of it is doing interviews with students and getting them to talk about the way they experience colorism on campus, right? And I'll talk more about how we can get better statistics to see how colorism impacts people a little bit later. And then another category of the interpersonal piece is the microaggressions. And I separate that because this can happen in the classroom itself. This can happen in professional settings, right? So maybe a student works on campus and their supervisor treats them differently than the lighter skinned students, right? Or then the non-Black students. And so they feel those microaggressions. Or in class, a white student might say, well, why are you always so angry? Or why don't you always smile, right? Why don't, why don't you ever smile? Or why are you always late for class? You're so late all the time, right? And so the social life is one thing, but colorism is impacting students even in their interpersonal interactions in the academic and professional areas of life as well. And microaggressions can be words as well as actions. So keep that in mind. And then the last piece is institutional. So again, institutional can contribute to the stress piece. So all of these things are influencing and impacting each other. An important thing to know about the institutional piece, and I don't think we have any faculty watching, but some people joined late, so maybe we do, or administrators, I should say. But the pipeline, who even gets to college in the first place is largely impacted by colorism. I know. <laughs> People are surprised. They, they, a lot of people really think colorism is just about, you know, being the princess on TV. But colorism actually makes it harder for darker skinned people to attain college degrees in the first place, starting all the way in pre-K and kindergarten and up because of things like discrimination in terms of 
discipline, disciplinary patterns, right? More likely to be suspended for the same infractions, more likely to be perceived as less intelligent and therefore tracked into lower performing courses and things like that, not being recommended or nominated for certain academic opportunities because they because of stereotypes of about intelligence and about competence. Okay. So even just the pipeline of who's making it to college is something that institutionally we need to be aware of. Just like we create programs for minority students as a whole, we have to look for diversity in those programs and make sure that we're serving the diversity among the diverse, if that makes sense. Representation is important, right? So institutions have to think about who their faculty are, um, who their staff is, mentors. Are there mentors of all shades, mentors of different kinds of hair textures, mentors of other types of difference as well for the students that are that need to be served. And then even in marketing and promotion, right? Who um, are who is featured in commercials, who is featured in brochures and pamphlets and things like that. And then the academic side of things. Uh, also lack of actions being overlooked, right? Yes. So JC is adding to the microaggression conversation that a microaggression can also be being ignored, right? So someone, let's say, brings donuts to the office and they give donuts to everyone, but they somehow forgot to stop by your office to give you a donut as well. So it's about what people say and don't say and what people do and don't do that we have to pay attention to. So in the academic sense, just like I mentioned in terms of the pipeline, there's a lot of bias and stereotypes just in terms of who's considered competent and intelligent, right? Some studies show that lighter skinned people are perceived as having higher levels of education. Even employees, when we're hiring staff, when we're hiring faculty, that and hiring managers make their decisions more on the base of skin tone than on levels of education, right? And so we know these realities when it comes to racial disparities, and many people still are not aware that those realities exist based on skin tone as well. And in fact, in the interpersonal sense, the skin tone can make a bigger difference. And a lot of these graphs and charts and statistics that you'll see, what we typically consider a racial disparity actually pans out to be a color disparity. So that lighter skinned people of color are pretty much on par with white Americans. And so the disparity is really between dark skinned people of color and lighter skinned to white people in the United States. Um, and then the curriculum itself, as I mentioned in terms of how we teach black history and who we are featuring in our discussions about black history, we have to make sure that the curriculum represents diverse kinds of intellectuals and scholars. And so it's not enough just to say, well, I'm teaching a lot of Latinx authors, I'm teaching a lot of African-American authors, right? Look at whether or not there's hom homogeneity amongst those authors that you're teaching, or is there diversity amongst those African-American authors that you're teaching? And that, you know, yes, we're talking about colorism, but that includes gender, right? Or, am I teaching only black male authors? Or am I teaching only lighter skinned um, African-Americans and scholars? And then extracurricular and co-curricular opportunities. A lot of times there's the intersection of class that plays out in particular, um, but in terms of acceptance and bias into student organizations, acceptance and bias and stereotypes that play out when you want to maybe study abroad, do you feel like you will have um, access to that either financially or socially, right? And then opportunities beyond that. So internships or, you know, um, fellowships, right? That people can apply for. Are we looking at the skin tone representation um, across these different activities or are we only looking at the racial demographic? All right, so Dr. Williams says, which is evident in the workplace, entertainment and education, yes. And also I'll say, you know, so Dr. Williams says it's evident in all these spaces. A lot of times people will point to the exceptions or the, it's, it's like, it's no different from someone saying, well, 
we had Barack Obama as president, so there's no racism, right? So I just want to caution anyone who might be tempted to say, well, you know, there's a dark skinned professor in my department. Like that might be the case, like that might be true, but we have to look at larger patterns, right? So yes, we have Barack Obama as president, but the vast majority of, well, every other president besides him has been white, right? And so we can do the same thing when it comes to colorism, just because there is a Lupita Nyong'o who gets an Academy Award, doesn't mean there's no colorism, right? Because we have to look at all of the actresses over time throughout history who have gotten that award. I hope that makes sense. Okay. So I wanna pause again. This will give me a chance to get a drink of water. <laughs> but of these three layers of individual into personal institution, you can answer one or both of these questions. Which of these do you feel has impacted you the most? Or, and or, which of these are you most interested in learning more about or taking action on, right? So this is kind of be a preview for Colorism 102 at a later point, right? Where we can dig in more deeply into one of these aspects. But take a moment and, and just type in the chat, which of these layers, and it could be all three for you really, have impacted you the most? And or which are you most interested in learning about more or taking action on? All right, so, so far JC is saying, institutional, then interpersonal have impacted me the most. Janice says, all three, definitely. Sylvia says, interpersonal, all right. Any other thoughts? So I know we have several people who joined um, later. We are definitely being active in the chat. And then in just a short while, we're also gonna allow people to unmute and talk orally as well. So this question, it's not a trick question, but I also, I also note that a lot of times we focus on the colorism that we can feel, right? And the institutional stuff, we don't always feel that per se. It takes a higher level of observation and analysis to really see how colorism might work on an institutional level. But that interpersonal stuff, that one in the middle, that gets us every time, right? The microaggressions, being left out, not, not allowed into a space, right? Or being um, targeted because of how you look. Um, I'm, as I say that, I'm thinking about one ex experience I had at an art gallery where I was walking around the art gallery just like everyone else. And the security guard, who was a black woman, yelled at me from the balcony. She said, get away, step away from the, the, the um, sculpture. And I thought that was really strange because I was the darkest person in the art gallery and everyone else was walking around the sculpture just like me, but I was targeted, I was singled out because of, I think, my skin tone. And even as I'm saying that, um, there, there's this, tendency to say, well, I don't know if it was colorism. I can't really say, I don't know if it was colorism. You never know why somebody might be interacting with you in that way. And it's the same story around racism, right? We, we don't, technically, could it have been racism? Yes. Could it have not been racism? Maybe, right? And so you have to trust your guts in these situations and look and observe and be aware for yourself and make that assessment. Um, Gail Boker says individual and interpersonal. Yeah, so definitely the individual and interpersonal is the kind of in your face colorism, right? The words that you get taught um, about people, the things you see in the media, whether or not your friends um, make certain comments. I was reading an article where darker skin girls had lighter skin friends who would make colorist comments. And that was one of their ways of experiencing colorism on campus, right? Okay, but what can we do? What can we do about colorism? So I like acronyms, acronyms and analogies. If you, if you, you probably can tell already 
just from the first half of this presentation that I like acronyms and analogies. I talk in acronyms and analogies a lot. And I think go to bat is a slang term, <laughs> right? I, I'll, I will go to bat for that. And so BAT stands for Mitigate Bias, Disaggregate Analytics. So that kind of goes to my earlier mentions and then explicit teaching. And I'm, I wanted to focus on the college university setting in particular with these three things. So let's look a little more closely. When I talk about mitigate bias, we know personal bias, but there's also institutional bias. And so when it comes to personal bias, some ways that we can mitigate that are to help us address our bias. A, is to acknowledge that we have it. You can't do anything about a bias that you don't know you have. You can't do anything about a bias that you are afraid to admit to, right? There is a test you can take, the Harvard Implicit Association test. They have one on color. They also have one on race, gender, age, and a host of other factors that I can't remember at this time. So A, have the courage to acknowledge where your biases are. And I'll say that we all have bias. By virtue of being in Western society, by virtue of being in a white supremacist, anti-Black culture like we have in the United States, all of us are prone to, are conditioned to in subtle ways to have a pro-white and a pro-white bias, right? So some ways to mitigate that also are how we expose ourselves to images, the narratives that we expose ourselves to, the content that we consume and the messages we're getting from that. So just like I showed you the images of Ebony Magazine and the skin bleaching ads, right? We have to be aware of what kinds of messages we're receiving and work to find alternative messages that are healthier and more fitting. And then institutional bias, Janice says one of the hardest steps is to acknowledge, but absolutely necessary, 100%. Yeah, that, and I'll say too, don't feel bad if you have a bias. Like I said, it's the default for anyone born in this country. It's the default. Your responsibility is to do something about it, right? So don't beat yourself up or think, well, how could I have a bias, right? It's about what we do with that information once we have it. Institutional bias has a lot to do with the systems that are in place that disproportionately impact um, certain groups of people negatively. And so a couple of ways to mitigate institutional bias, A, is to have committees, have people in charge of auditing your policies, have people in charge of looking at your policies and practices and procedures specifically to identify potential bias, right? Um, I know at my university, our interim chancellor just instituted this kind of committee, right? Where they're looking at policies and practices and procedures and saying, where can we be more effective in creating equitable practices here? And then I'll say this too, if you're in a position of any kind of power, right? If you're a student president, student body president, right? Or if you are a staff member, or if you um, work, have a work job on campus of some sort, you can ask for a double review. So when we're publishing articles in academia, peer reviewed, that means that more than one person has approved of something or said yes to something. So for example, if you know you have a bias against people who are older, right? You can ask a colleague to take a second look at the resume and ask what they see in the resume, right? And so have checks and balances in place to mitigate for the varying biases that we might all have. Um, this aggregating analytics. So I, I mentioned earlier how we can't just look at racial demographics on college campuses. Racial demographics are the easiest to attain. And that's why there's so much more information about race. There's so much more information about racism because those demographics are readily collected. Every form, every census, every test, every um, survey asks you for your race or ethnicity, right? How many of you have taken a survey or form or filled out a census that asks for your skin tone? It's a much harder category to collect, right? So JC says never, so true. 
And it's easy to collect racial data, but that only gives us part of the picture, right? So yeah, we're like, oh, we're doing good. Our numbers are looking good in terms of diversity and racial diversity and ethnic diversity. But if you were to put everyone in a room, would they all look the same? That's the, the additional layer we have to get to. And so you might not be able to look to um, quantitative data, but in your interactions with students, in your interactions in the classroom, in your interactions just on any, anywhere on campus, ask yourself, yeah, yes, we have all races represented, but do we have a range of phenotypes? Do we have a range of skin tones, right? Even though we have this international student group, are all the students in that group lighter skinned people of color, right? And then this is important in terms of support. So in my earlier slide, I talked about the pipeline of just getting to college being a barrier, colorism being a barrier to that. And so as we're instituting support for people based on racial demographics, our class, or being a first generation college student, we also have to make sure that they have mentors and opportunities, especially in like the counseling center, for example, hiring culturally competent people to work in the counseling center, looking at your student health center, right? The hospitals, the doctor's offices on campus and making sure that there's adequate representation and support, not just based on the demographics that are easy to identify, but being willing to go the extra mile and saying, okay, yes, so I have, you know, a black therapist, but do I have a black therapist who represents, black therapists who represent the diversity of black people on campus? And so this again means that schools and institutions cannot rely on tokenism, right? You can't say, okay, well, we have a black therapist. You have to be willing to increase the diversity of people on campus. Um, Dr. Williams says, and there's so many ways to describe our skin tone. <laughs> yes. And the last one is explicit teaching. So even if you're not a faculty member, even if you're not a teacher, you can still engage in explicit teaching about colorism, right? So Dr. Williams brought me here today. This is one example of explicit teaching about colorism, right? So wherever you are given a platform on campus, include colorism as part of the conversation that you're having. But then in the actual curriculum as well, as I stated before, we have to look at is colorism a part of the curriculum? Do we have a class being taught on colorism? Do we have books in the library where students can do research on colorism? Do we bring in people to talk about colorism? And then again, as we're using scholars of color, as we're diversifying our syllabi, we can't just look at the racial or ethnic demographic as well. We have to check and see do these people of color that we're starting to include and bring to the table, do they also have a range of phenotypes? Do they have the range of skin tones and facial features that truly represents the diversity of that ethnic group or of that racial group? All right, so that is my little breakdown. Where are we on time? Okay, so we have 30 minutes. I'm actually, we're actually right on time. So I wanted to leave 30 minutes for the open Q&A discussion. I appreciate everyone who's been talking in the chat and responding to some of my prompts along the way. And I hope you have been taking notes on ideas and thoughts that have come up for you. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, turn on the gallery view, and we'll start to take these initial um, meetings. That's okay with Dr. Williams. You're muted. Thank you, Dr. Webb. I want to say thank you so much for bringing this topic to the WashU community um, and engaging the folks who are in the room today. I truly appreciate this. Um, I took several notes myself. Um, and so I appreciate the opportunity to learn and engage around um, this 101 kind of overarching theme for this workshop. And then hopefully we can bring you back when we are having in-person events um, to have a more um, intimate conversation around it as well, but to go deeper into this topic, because I do think there are 
are several more conversations that can come from this. Um, and I do hope that we can engage further. So thank you very much for your time and your expertise today. And thank you for everyone who attended. Um, again, we do have more Black History Month programming coming out of the CDI. And then I'm already planning for our Women's History Month programming. And so there's a lot to expect in March as well. And so I will stop the recording here.